All right, everybody. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We're getting started a few minutes late here. Thanks, everybody, for bearing with us. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to the webinar today. We're covering State Environmental Impact Report and Project Environmental Impact Report guidance. Uh, my name is Mike McDaniel. I'm a PDC with the Office of Environmental Management. Um, I'm going to be running the poll questions today and trying to assist with questions after the presentation. Um, I'd also like to introduce today's presenter, which is Christine Haddock. Christine is an in-house consultant that assists us with updates to the PD&E manual and trainings. So next slide, please. So we're just going to go through a couple of housekeeping things and go to webinars. So with the webinar controls, um, if you guys have questions throughout the webinar, uh, click the question drop down box and enter those questions throughout the webinar. We'll try to reply to some during the webinar. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. Um, if you guys have technical issues, try first to close your web browser and then rejoin the webinar. We're going to try to monitor the audio throughout, but usually that can help fix some of the errors. Um, and then we are going to have poll questions, and I'm going to launch the first poll question here in a minute. Um, so when they pop up on the screen, you just need to select the answer that uh, fits and we will get started with that so next slide christine so poll question number one so i'll just give you guys 20 or 30 seconds to answer that which entity do you represent So we'll give you guys about 10 more seconds, get your answers in. All right, I'm gonna close it. So it looks like we have some representation. Oh, lots of consultants, 72%. Some people from central office and some folks from the district. Very good. All right. So with that, um, I am going to give it back to Christine and she will take us through the SEER peer training today. Thanks everybody. Thanks Mike. This training today includes six lessons. And um, we've got lesson one, the overview of the state, local or privately funded project delivery and discussion of the lead agency. Lesson two, non-major state action. Lesson three, we're going to get into those state environmental impact reports or SEERS. Lesson four, we'll discuss those state funded projects with federal action. In lesson five, we'll go over the project environmental impact reports. And in lesson six, we'll discuss the differences between a SEER, peer, and federal NEPA documentation. Part 1, Chapter 10 of FDOT's PD&E manual provides detailed guidance on that state, local, or privately funded project delivery process that we're going to be um, discussing today. This chapter is a valuable resource to accompany the information that's provided in this webinar. And as you can see, a link to the manual is provided below. And please note that links to all the training materials that are going to be mentioned um, during this webinar are going to be provided at the end. Lesson one will provide an overview of the process and discussion of the lead agency responsibilities. Environmental evaluations are required for all state funded projects to comply with state and federal laws and FDOT policy. State funded projects are those advanced through the FDOT work program using only um, state transportation allocations. And for the purposes of this training um, and as outlined in the chapter, they don't require Federal Highway Administration or um, Federal Highway funding for OEM or OEM action pursuant to 23 USC Section 327. The proposed projects on the interstate or using interstate right of way 
or projects that use federal highway funds require preparation of a federal national environmental policy act or NEPA document. And these types of federal projects are not going to be covered in this training. Part one, chapter four of the pd &E manual provides guidance on that federal process. There's also local agency program or LAP projects that use federal highway funds and therefore they are also considered federal projects and are not going to be covered today. This training will focus on those primarily on those state funded projects in which DOT is the lead agency. However, we're also going to discuss projects on state facilities that may be led by a local agency, such as the county or city or by an expressway authority or other private entity. The lead agency is responsible for the project and thus has signature authority on the environmental document. And the lead agency for these purposes is not necessarily the funding agency, and it may be a local agency. When a local agency or private entity is the lead agency, then FDOT involvement may be required under certain conditions. And we're going to go over these types of projects in more detail in Lesson 5. This flowchart here, it summarizes the FDOT state, local, or privately funded project delivery process that's discussed throughout Part 1, Chapter 10 of the pd &E Manual. And the first question asks if there are federal highway funds. Well, yes, then the NEPA process must be followed. If the answer is no, then the next question that it asks is if it's an FDOT project. If not, then the process for local or privately funded projects is followed and the local agency or private entity may prepare a project environmental impact report called a PEER to serve as the environmental documentation. If it is an FDOT project, then the next question asks if the project requires screening in the environmental screening tool or EST. If it meets the qualifications for screening, once the programming screening is completed, then the district prepares a state environmental impact report or SEER. And at the end of this process, the SEER is approved by the district secretary or designee. Now, for those FDOT projects that don't require EST screening, then the district prepares a non-major state action checklist. And this non-major state action serves as the environmental document. For FDOT projects with state funding only, the districts including including Florida's Turnpike Enterprise, are the lead agencies. Now, SEERS may have moderate to substantial environmental impacts and require a pd &E study. And we'll discuss the SEERS tier process in Lesson 3. Those non-major state action projects are prepared for projects with minimal environmental impacts and are prepared during design. And due to these minimal impacts, they don't require EST screening or a, a full-blown pd &E study. Non-major state actions will be discussed further in Lesson 2. If it's determined that the project will be state funded only, then it's assigned a work program identifier of state funds only or SFO. Once it's determined to be an SFO project, then it's not all that easy to change to a federal project. The funding determinations and programming decisions are made early through the statewide acceleration transformation process or SWAT process. And this process is a project management approach that streamlines DOT's project delivery process through early coordination and communication among the different functional offices within the district. And more information on this process is provided in the SWAT training work workbook and the OEM SWAT webpage. FDOT uses the Efficient Transportation Decision Making or ETDM process to provide early identification of potential environmental considerations and transportation planning to streamline project delivery. Typically, the ETDM coordinators provided a list of projects which could, um, should complete a screening generally as a result of the SWAT process. And projects that qualify for the ETDM screening include those that propose additional through lanes, such as capacity improvement projects, new roadways, reconstructed arterial highways, the addition of interchange or major interchange modifications to a freeway or expressway, and new bridges. 
And this list of qualifying projects is provided in part one, chapter two of the pd and &E manual, as well as in the ETDM manual. This image here is a graphical flowchart of the ETDM process. First, the district decides whether to initiate project screening with either an ETDM planning screen or a programming screen event. And this decision is based upon the project complexity, the timing, and whether or not an ETDM planning screen had already been completed. The ETDM planning screen should occur when considering projects for inclusion or prioritization within the cost feasible plan. During the planning screen, comments received from the Environmental Technical Advisory Team or ETAP members and the public help FDOT and the Metropolitan Planning Organizations or MPOs and transportation planning organizations to identify environmental considerations that assist in assessing projects for inclusion or advancement in that long range transportation plan and further into the cost feasible plan. Now, during the programming screen, the qualifying projects are reviewed when being considered for funding in FDOT's five year work program or MPO transportation improvement program or if they're already funded before advancing to the PD&E phase. Now, during the programming screen, those qualifying projects that we had just gone over, they undergo ETAT review and coordination, and also advanced notification may be initiated. At the conclusion of the programming screen, the project scope is developed, and the final programming screen summary report is published as the project advances to the PD&E phase. Now, those ETDM um, screening event results, they're used for further project planning, for project scoping, and for SWOT activities prior to initiation of the PDNE. And as you can see at the bottom of the image here, the ETAC coordination is ongoing throughout planning and programming events. And also, both the ETDM manual and the PDNE manual are followed to ensure compliance with this process. And that wraps up our overview. I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to Mike to send out our second poll question. All right, um, true or false, environmental evaluations are required for all FDOT led projects to comply with state and federal laws and FDOT policy. Give everybody about 10 more seconds to get your answers in. All right, I'm gonna close it. So it looks like most of you said true, 84%, that is correct. So I am going to Go ahead and give it back to Christine. In lesson two, we're gonna briefly discuss those non-major state actions. And as I mentioned earlier, the non-major state actions are those FDOT-led projects that don't qualify for the ETDM process. And therefore, they do not require a PD&E study. Now, projects that to, are proceed as non-major state actions are typically identified during the SWOT planning meeting. The non-major state actions are not expected to have substantial environmental impacts, but yet they require an environmental evaluation and completion of a non-major state action checklist. And this is prepared using the Statewide Environmental Project Tracker, or SWEFT. This checklist documents consideration of the environmental impacts. And also supporting documents or technical reports may be needed um, for some of the topics. Coordination with agencies may also be needed as well to ensure that there are no substantial impacts to the environmental resources. And if there are substantial impacts, then typically a SEER is prepared instead of a non-major state action. The non-major state action checklist is divided into three different sections, general information, the project description and evaluation. The general information section identifies the name of the project, its limits, 
the county, and also the financial management members. The project description section includes a brief description of the existing conditions, the purpose and need, and the proposed improvements such as the number of lanes, structure, median, and right-of-way. The evaluation section provides a checklist to evaluate the potential impacts of the project. And guidance on determining impacts and responding to the questions in the checklist is provided in the different topic chapters in part two of the pd and &E manual. And generally these chapters, um, along with that area of interest tool in the EST and also the preparer's familiarity with the project area, these are used to help complete this section. A brief summary of the evaluation may also be included. And if any of the items is marked yes, then it's going to be discussed and determined by the district whether additional evaluation is needed or if actually a SEER needs to be prepared instead. If it remains as a non-major state action, then the rationale of why it would be a yes is provided in the checklist. If all, check, all of the answers are no and the project doesn't require a public hearing, then the project fits the requirements of a non-major state action. Now, for more information on completing a non-major state action checklist, um, you can see the chapter, part one, chapter 10 of the PD&E manual. And there's also a SWEP non-major state action, um, some videos that are provided on OEM's training track to website. Now, non-major state actions generally don't require a public hearing, but they require public involvement activities in accordance with part one, chapter 11 of the pd &E manual. And the district will complete that non-major state action checklist and the environmental manager or designee will electronically approve it and swept. After this approval, they may also complete the environmental certification for state funded project form, which is in swept. And this form certifies that the environmental analysis has been completed and also um, to provide the environmental clearance to continue to the project delivery process. And when a non-major state action is completed before the conclusion of the design phase, then the district, district should confirm whether a reevaluation of the non-major state action is necessary before completing the environmental certification for state funded project form. It's now time to delve into the process of preparing those state environmental impact reports here in lesson three. State funded FDOT pd &E studies are documented in a state environmental impact report or SEER. The SEER documents those, the social, economic, cultural, natural, and physical issues or resources evaluated as a part of the project. And depending on the impact to the environmental resources, SEERs may be prepared at the same level um, as different types of environmental documents. It could be at the level of a type two categorical exclusion or an environmental assessment level or at the level of an environmental impact statement. And all SEERs are now prepared using a form in SWEPT. The SEER form allows for concise documentation of the results of the engineering and the environmental analysis and coordination. And the SEERs prepared and approved at the district level. So the districts may request OEM review of a SEER if they would like. The SEER summarizes the results of that engineering and environmental analysis, which includes the assessment of project impacts and completion of technical reports. The amount of analysis that is needed is going to depend on the magnitude of the impacts, which could be from minor to substantial. It also summarizes the public outreach activities, coordination with agencies and stakeholders, and compliance with state and federal laws and regulations. Chapters in part two of the pd &E manual detail how to conduct the analysis for each of these issues or resources and provide guidance on coordination and specifics on what should be included in the SEER, depending on the level of impacts. Guidance on completing the form is found in part one, chapter 10 of the pd &E manual. And there's also recording trainings that are available on OEM's training website, including a SEER tool webinar, and also a series of videos that were recorded from an OEM environmental training for Florida's Turnpike Enterprise. The SEER tool webinar provides like 
specific instructions on how to complete the form in SWEFT, while the Turnpike training provides more information on conducting and documenting the engineering and environmental analysis. And it includes videos for each of the topics that um, are included in the SEER. Now we're gonna walk through the various sections of the SEER form within SWEFT. The first one, this want to add some clarification here that each of these topics in the form is going to allow you to upload documents as either technical materials or as attachments. Now, those technical materials, those are the documents that are contained under separate cover and they're incorporated only by reference. They should be referenced in the SEER itself and they're included in the project file in SWIFT. And this includes those technical reports, such as a project traffic analysis report or a conceptual stage relocation plan, natural resource evaluation, and also the preliminary engineering report, as well as any technical memorandums and studies. And documents that are added as attachment, attachments, those are included in the appendix and they're considered to be a part of this year document. The appendix contains documents which support the findings and this may include concurrence letters, determin determinations of effect, and also MOUs. The first section of the form includes project information, including the project description, the purpose and need, and planning consistency. The project information um, section includes the project name, project limits, the district, the county, um, ETDM and FM numbers, and also district contact information. This information is automatically populated and swept as it is pulled from the work program based on the FM number. Now the project description includes the proposed action in terms of location, length, and termini of the project and typical section. The purpose and need identifies and describes the transportation needs and the purpose it is intended to satisfy. And this information can be developed early in the planning process and reassessed during the pd &E study. And more detailed guidance on preparing this information is found in part two, chapter one of the pd &E manual. And please note, we've included some text here from an existing project as samples of the type of information that's provided in both the project description and the purpose and need section. And please note, this does not include all the text that is in what was in the sections for this project. And we're not gonna discuss each example. These are really provided for easy reference material in case you wanna go back and review this presentation um, at a later time. Now, planning consistency is not required for the approval of a SEER. However, to the extent that that information is available, it should be provided because it serves to inform the stakeholders and assists in the timely advancement of project funds for the next phase. And if funding is identified for subsequent phases, and then you complete the form identifying the current status of the Transportation Improvement Program and State Transportation Improvement Program approval for final design, right-of-way, and construction. A description of actions required for completion of the planning consistency information should be provided if it's not available at the time of the document approval. Supporting documentation for project planning consistency should be uploaded, such as those appropriate pages of the current plans. And more information is available on planning consistency in Part 1, Chapter 4 and Part 2, Chapter 1 of the pd &E Manual as well as FDOT and Federal Highway Consistency Guidance that's provided um, on the FDOT Office of Policy Planning's Metropolitan Planning Support webpage. Now, this guidance is provided for documenting consistency information for those federal projects. However, it may also be very useful for SEERS. The level of analysis um, that is done should identify the impacts and address the comments provided during the programming screen and the advanced notification process. Um, these would be comments from ETAP members, other agencies, interested parties, tribes, and the public. The environmental analysis section, it documents the results of the analysis for each issue or resource. 
um, the knowledge of the project area, the input from agencies and the public, as well as input through scoping efforts. Each issue or resource in the environmental analysis section should describe the existing conditions, the potential degree of impacts, comparisons between alternatives, and may include some standard statements that are generated in the swept form. Basically, it should summarize the analysis that was conducted on the specific resource. The environmental analysis itself is completed using that guidance, as I mentioned before, in part two of the pd and &E manual. Um, part two includes separate chapters covering the social and economic, the cultural, natural, and physical environmental resources shown here. Now, these chapters provide guidance on how to conduct the environmental and en engineering analysis, how to assess project impacts, consult with resource agencies, and also how to complete the specific technical reports. Some issues are evaluated differently when there is no federal involvement, and most of the chapters covering the environmental resources will have a corresponding training, and links to these along with the manual chapters can be found on the pd and &E manual website. In the swept-based SEER form, there is a page for each of the environmental resources divided up in, by sub-resource. So for the social and economic section, you will see uh, the subsections for each of these listed here. And the form will allow you to check whether any of the resources here are enhanced or whether they will have a substantial impact or not. And a brief summary is provided for each resource. Commitments can be added, and also those technical materials and attachments can be uploaded. And each of the resources discussed in the following slides, they can be documented in the SEER form in that same manner. And also for those following environmental resource slides, we've included some example language from an existing project. And like I mentioned before, we're not gonna go over each of these examples. These are just provided um, for reference material. And please note again, these examples are not going to include all of the text that you would include in this section. The next section on cultural resources summarizes the evaluation of historic resources protected by the Florida Historical Resources Act, Section 6F of the Land Water Conservation Fund Act, as well as recreational areas and protected land. And here's where you'd upload that cultural resource assessment survey report, um, the Section 106 Programmatic Agreement Impact Form, State Historic Preservation Office or SHPO Concurrence Letters, Section 6F Documentation, and any coordination documents regarding recreational areas and protected lands, such as um, state-owned upland conservation land. And here's an example of information included under the Florida Historical Resources Act subsection. It confirms that the assessment complies with the act. It discusses the archeological resources that were identified in the area's potential effect. And it includes a summary of the historic resources survey. The natural resources um, section includes these following subsections. Um, and here you're also going to upload that natural resources evaluation and coordination or concurrence letters with the resource agencies. Here we have an example of information included in the protected species and habitat subsection, stating that the project was evaluated for potential occurrences of federally listed and state listed animal and plant species. It also includes the result of the evaluation and references a map and a table. It also includes the determination that there were no federally designated critical habitat um, in the project study area. The physical resources section includes subsections um, that are listed here. And the example provided here is um, in the highway traffic noise subsection. The permit section allows selection of federal, state, and local permit types that will be needed for the project. 
And these should have been identified um, through coordination with permit agencies and the permit coordinator during the environmental analysis. Information is also added on the status of the permits in question. And more information can be found in part one, chapter 12 of the pv &E manual. In the engineering section, the engineering technical documents are uploaded. And this is typically the preliminary engineering report, which includes considerations concerning evaluation of existing conditions, selection of design parameters, alternatives evaluation, and selection of that preferred alternative. Now, one thing to note here is that SEERs do not require the evaluation of multiple alternatives. And more information on engineering analysis is found in part two, chapter three of the pd &E manual, and also the OEM environmental training for Florida's Turnpike Enterprise. It does have a recording on engineering. The commitments section of the form includes a summary of commitments previously identified um, when completing the individual sections of the form. Other commitments can also be uploaded here, um, commitments are documented following FDOT's project commitment tracking procedure. And guidance on preparing commitments can be found in Part 2, Chapter 22 of the pd &E Manual. And there's also a computer-based NEPA introductory course covering commitments. It, it's FDOT's policy to promote public involvement opportunities and information exchange activities in all functional areas, including various techniques adapted to local area condition and project requirements. Part 1, Chapter 11 of the pd &E Manual provides guidance on how this is achieved during pd &E. The public involvement process outlined in this chapter is followed when you're preparing a SEER. The public involvement section documents if a public hearing is required and the status of holding that public hearing. For a project that doesn't require a public hearing, then the opportunity for a public hearing may still be provided and documented. Section 339.155 of the Florida statutes requires a public hearing for the following types of projects for those that increase capacity through the addition of new lanes. Um, if they provide new access to a limited or controlled access facility, such as a new interchange, or construction of a facility in a new location. Outreach activities are also summarized in this section, and the public involvement plan is uploaded. And these outreach activities, they may include things such as a kickoff meeting or public information meetings, newsletters, flyers, and small group meetings. Once the technical materials um, have been uploaded while preparing the sections that we just went over, um, you'll see them listed at the end here in a technical materials section. New ones can also be added here if not entered earlier. And these documents vary um, depending on the impacts of the project. And they include, you know, reports, technical reports such as that natural resources evaluation, the cultural resources assessment survey report, and also the preliminary engineering report. And all their though they're listed here, the documents themselves will only be included in the SWEP project file. Similarly, those um, uploaded attachments will be listed in the attachments section. And these will vary again, depending on the impacts of the project. Examples include concurrence letters from SHPO and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Although listed here, the documents themselves will be included in the appendix and will be a part of the SEER. For projects where the documents need to be displayed for public availability, such as um, for a public hearing, then an option for public availability review can be selected here under this um, Send for Review tab. The district environmental manager or the project development manager will then sign the form electronically um, to accept the project for public review. Once the SEER is completed and documents uploaded, then the district environmental or project development manager will certify it and submit it to the district secretary or designee for approval. Once approved, 
It's then circulated to those resource agencies and offices responsible for the next phase. The district environmental office uh, may then also prepare an environmental certification for state funded projects and select. Now to give you an idea of what a completed SEER looks like, we've prepared this short video run through of a sample SEER document. And please note, this is just a sample project. Okay, I see that you guys are not able to hear this um, audio from the video. How about I do a run through of this at the end of this training. I'll just do a quick run through of um, this sample project. Sorry about that. So before we head on to the next lesson, um, Let's briefly go over the reevaluations for the SEERS. And reevaluations are necessary um, for design changes resulting in new or additional impacts. Um, these may require those agency consultation or new public involvement. And for project changes due to changes in law, the passage of time, or changes in resource or issue status. Um, when advancing to right-of-way or construction phase, if longer than a year since approval of this year or that last re-evaluation. Um, often there may be an overlap of phases, such as the right-of-way and the design phases. And in this case, a re-evaluation could cover both. Re-evaluations are now prepared and swept and are approved by the district approving authority. More information on SEER reevaluations re is provided in Part 1, Chapter 10 of the PD&E Manual. Also, the OEM Environmental Training for Florida's Turnpike Enterprise has recordings on how to um, prepare a SEER reevaluation. And let's wrap up this lesson with a poll question. All right. Um, should be showing up for everybody there. Uh, which of the following is not a section included in a state environmental impact report form? Give you guys about 10 or 15 seconds. All right, I'm going to close it out. Looks like most of you said construction costs. That is correct. I'm going to uh, let Christine take back control. Okay, in lesson four, um, we're going to take a closer look at state funded projects with federal actions. Federal permits may be required for a state funded project and may require the preparation of a NEPA document for one of those agencies. In such cases, consultation with the appropriate federal agency should be performed really early on. Um, OEM can assist with this consultation if needed. And projects that are state funded may still have to follow the federal NEPA process if a federal permit is required. 
Federal permits or actions may be required by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Coast Guard, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or the National Marine Fisheries Service. Now in Lesson 5, um, let's switch gears a bit and discuss projects in which um, state fund that are state funded in which DOT is not the lead agency and also a preliminary environmental impact report here may be prepared. Those local privately or funded or local or privately funded projects must comply with all the requirements of federal, state, and local laws. And this is stipulated in section 334.30 three of the Florida statute. The statute states that these projects must comply with all the requirements of federal, state, and local laws, state, regional, and local comprehensive plans, department rules, policies, procedures, and standards for um, transportation facilities, and any other conditions which the department determines to be in the public's best interest. Unsolicited public-private transportation projects must also comply with Chapter 14, 107 of the Florida Administrative Code. The construction of permanent features in FDOT right-of-way performed and funded by others and without federal highway funds requires execution of an FDOT construction agreement. And there's a form that's available on the FDOT's procedural document library that assists with preparation of this agreement. The construction agreement application package should include evidence of acquisition of all applicable federal and state environmental permits. For local agency or private entity-led projects, the role of the district environmental office is to provide support in an advisory capacity as necessary to assist in advancing the project. Completion of environmental analysis and documentation by the applicant prior to the environmental permit application may follow the same process and format as a non-major state action or SEER. However, the local agency or private entity should recognize that these document types are reserved for FDOT funded projects. Instead, the supporting environmental documentation for local and privately funded projects constructed on FDOT right-of-way um, necessary to acquire environmental permits and subsequently an FDOT construction agreement. Um, these types of projects may be, um, end up being a preliminary environmental impact report or peer. Now, local agency or private entity-led projects, um, you know, as I said, might be documented in a peer. Um, the peer includes analysis, um, both environmental and engineering, and includes sim similar information and topics as the peer, but it's not prepared and swept. So the format is a little bit different. The outline of a peer is available here as a figure in Part 1, Chapter 10 of the pd &E Manual. And although it's not an FDOT document, it's prepared following the same procedures and has some of the same requirements as the SEER except that it's not going to be approved and signed um, by DOT. It is going to be approved and signed instead by that local agency or private entity. In um, cases where a privately or locally funded project's jurisdiction is going to be transferred to FDOT, you know, later at any time during project development, then the district should work with the local agency or the private entity to determine whether a peer or a SEER um, should be prepared. If the project's to be transferred to DOT, then a SEER is most likely the appropriate document. And in such cases, the FDOT may coordinate, um, review, and approve a document prepared by a local or private entity as a SEER. The district should coordinate with the local agency or the private entity to determine the level of analysis to satisfy the documentation requirements. Now, a local agency may advance a project through any one of several state funding programs, such as the County Incentive Grant Program and the Transportation Regional Incentive Program. For these projects, if state, fund, state funds are being used, then the local agency may prepare a peer to support its acquisition of appropriate environmental permits and to satisfy other agreements with the FDOT. The local agency should follow the procedures outlined in Part 1, Chapter 10 of the pd &E Manual. 
And there may be instances when a local agency seeks to advance a project with federal highway funds in addition to state funds or local funds. And in these cases, a federal environmental document or NEPA document would generally be prepared by that local agency with FDOT support and um, as deemed appropriate through early project coordination using um, the FDOT local agency program or LAP. And for more information on LAP, um, you can see FDOT's local agency program manual, which is available on FDOT's procedural document library website. And a thorough understanding of funding sources, system designation, proposed work activity, and existing or proposed agreements, um, such as a joint participation agreement or a memorandum of agreement, assists in determining if the project should advance as a peer or as a SEER or as a federal environmental document. A private or local entity, entity may not provide FDOT environmental certification to advance a project in the work program. And on the other, other hand, FDOT should not provide a certification on a private or local entity or certification to a private or local entity. And it's now time for our last poll question. Okay, for our wrap-up, um, let's review the difference between SEER, PEER, and federal NEPA documentation. This table here um, summarizes some of the key differences between federal, state, and local or private projects. One of the main things to note is that state and local or private projects can require federal permits and trigger NEPA compliance. Key takeaways and perhaps some of the most common encountered items include the fact that um, state projects require consultation with the Division of Historic Resources um, per Chapter 20, 267 in Florida statutes, but a federal permit would trigger Section 106. Um, there's no Section 4F evaluation for state or local private projects because this is a USDOT requirement. However, coordination with the local entity managing the recreation area should still occur. Farmlands and coastal barrier resources not analyzed in a SEER um, like they are for NEPA documents. And planning consistency is not required, but it's rather used for information only. And finally, only one build alternative is required um, to be evaluated for a SEER. FDOT's Office of Environmental Management has many different training opportunities um, that I've mentioned throughout this webinar. And recorded trainings are available um, in the Training Track 2 SWEFT, including videos on non-major state actions and that SEER tool webinar. There's also um, recommended trainings in Training Track 3 PBNE. Such topics, um, the topic-specific CBTs and recorded webinars. And as I mentioned before, there's these recordings of a training that was prepared specifically for Florida, Florida Turnpike Enterprise that is also highly recommended. Um, these are all available on the OEM website, and this, this slide um, provides their location. Other resources include the PD&E and ETDM manuals, 
the OEM SWAT webpage, and FDOT um, Office of Policy Planning's Metropolitan Planning Support webpage, as well as manuals, forms, and procedures that are available on FDOT's procedural document library. Now, thank you for your time and attention today. I'm not sure quite yet if we want to um, address um, questions or if we have time to go through that sample project. Hi, Christine, this is two. I think we have time for that sample project. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat and we will go through them right after Christine goes through the example, if you're still able to pull it up. Okay, yeah, I can pull it up. I won't try to run it at the video though. I'll just talk through it. Okay. So here is, um, you guys can see this okay, right? Okay, this is our sample project. You can see this, um, there's a cover page. The cover page has, um, you know, states that it's a SEER um, prepared by FDOT, has the basic project information that was automatically populated when the form was being prepared. The project manager is actually entered in. It includes um, this standard statement here. And then also is um, where the district secretary or designee's signature um, shows up once it is signed and approved. And this is kind of, you know, what comes up in SWEP with the electronic signature. There's also a second cover page, which includes um, the district contact information and also identifies um, the consulting firm. And then next is a table of contents. This is uh, this is generated in the SWEP form um, as it's being prepared. And this is laid out in the same order of, you know, that we went over these different topics uh, earlier in this training. And so first here we have a project location map and then the project information. Um, including, oh, I see I have a little bit of a delay here, sorry, um, including the project um, description section, subsection, purpose and need, and then planning consistency. If um, planning consistency was entered for the sample project, then it would show up here in the form of a table. Okay, and here we have um, this environmental analysis summary. And this, again, is something that is automatically generated depending on the selected the items that were selected while the form was being prepared and swept and basically shows if there were environmental impacts or enhancement or also for some issues if there was no involvement. And this covers all of those issue and resource topics. Okay, so um, the next session, section is on social and economic, with the first subheading being social, then economic, and notice the use of the table. Tables are very helpful in, you know, displaying information very clearly. Then the information on land use changes. Mobility, and aesthetic effects. And here we also have relocation potential under this um, heading. The next section is cultural resources with subsections on section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Section 6F of the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act, and also recreational areas and protected lands. The next section is on natural resources with subsections on wetlands and other surface waters. Okay. 
aquatic preserves in outstanding Florida waters, water resources, wild and scenic rivers, floodplains, coastal barrier resources, protected species and habitat, and also essential fish habitat. And notice here that some of these sections, you know, sometimes all that is needed is a simple statement here that states that there's no, you know, that the issue is not, the resource is not in the project area. And I believe this is um, a standard statement that automatically comes up if no involvement is selected. The next section is physical resources with subsections on highway traffic noise, air quality, contamination, utilities and railroads, construction, bicycles and pedestrians, and also navigation. The next section is permits, and this is a list of the environmental permits that were anticipated for this sample project. You know, it's got them listed here, and then it also has their status. And for this sample, um, they have yet to be acquired. Then we have the engineering and analysis support um, section. And basically what this is, it just states the, um, the document that includes the engineering analysis. And for this particular project, it was um, selected as the preliminary engineering report. And then the preliminary engineering report is, is included in um, the project file. The next section is project commitments. Notice this um, lists all those commitments that were entered as the form was being populated and swept. And also notice too that it numbers them, which is very helpful. And if the project needed to be approved for public availability, then here is where that signature would show up um, on the SEER. This next section, public involvement, um, this includes a summary of the pub public involvement activities. Um, it's got a sub summary of activities of those other than the public hearings. And then I believe here it has like the public hearing um, date. The next section is those list of technical materials. And remember, these are those technical materials that were prepared and um, they're not actually part of the report itself, but they're in the project file. Um, notice we've got the um, preliminary engineering report in here and the comment and coordination summary report, which were both actually referenced earlier in the text on this um, sample project. And then we have a list here of attachments. And um, note these are divided up by topics, um, each of the different topics that um, had their own page for filling out in the sweat form. Um, all the attachments are um, put under the subheading of where they were attached. And so we'll go into the appendix. Sorry about that. Okay, the first appendix we have for this sample project is a planning consist consistency appendix, which includes um, the planning consistency information. Okay, then we have the social and economic part, which has a um, land use map here, a couple of land use maps. The cultural resources appendix which I believe this is the SHPO concurrence letter for this particular project. I think it's got the concurrence signed here. And the natural resources appendix. 
This particular one has um, wetland maps. It has um, species maps. And then the physical resources appendix where this one has contamination maps. So this shows potential contaminated sites. And then public involvement section, let me scroll back up here. Um, this is the third public involvement um, appendix. It's going to have your um, public hearing transcript and also the public hearing certification at the end. So I think that wraps it up for our run through. I apologize again that we had to do this at the end. Let's go back and look and see if we have any questions for um, the question ses session. Christine, we did have one question. Uh, the question is, what's the logic behind planning consistency not being required for SEERS? And I think the response to that is planning consistency information to the extent it is available helps to inform the various parties involved in the process, including the public pursuant to 339.155. However, it is not required. Um, so that is the response for that one. Hopefully that answers your question, Kenneth. Thank you, too. Is that all that we have? As of right now, this is all I see. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to put it in the question box. We'll just wait a couple more minutes. I'm not seeing anything pop in. We have a question. Um, can a project have more than one preferred alternative, such as non-transit with transit design? I'm not quite sure I fully understand, but at least for the first part, as we advance, especially before we get to a public hearing, uh, we should only have one preferred alternative. So, But I'm not sure specifically what you're talking about for the other portion as, as far as the non-transit and with transit design portion. And then Mike, I'm gonna have you take this one. What was the answer to the last poll question? I don't even, um, I don't have that handy. Do you have that handy, Mike? There it is. Yeah, so I'm sorry, guys. I was actually on mute. Um, I was I was talking and nobody could hear me, but I'll put it back up on the screen. So this is the question, a project with the construction of permanent features in FDOT right of way performed and funded by others and without FHWA funds requires a FDOT construction agreement. So most of you guys were correct. I apologize on the technical difficulties on that. But that was the last poll question. And I will close that out.
So I guess it looks like at this time we don't have any more questions in the chat box. So I want to thank everybody for attending today. Thank Christine for giving a great presentation. And also everybody for bearing with us as we uh, dealt with some technical issues. But um, we made it through and I, and I hope this was helpful for everybody. So thanks again for attending and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks again.